Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, a lot going on in Washington. This has been a crazy week. This is a more spontaneous podcast than most. I did not have this on the calendar, but the scandals have been piling up so quickly in the White House that it just feels like something needs to be said. This is the first moment where the path to impeachment has seemed actually open. I have not been one of these people who felt that impeachment was likely, even though I dearly hope for it. But um, given just how inept Trump and his surrogates have been in containing the bleeding here, I feel like I'm beginning to see the possibility that this egregious man may not serve his full term. So I decided to reach out to a few experts who have already been on the podcast to give us their take. The first is Anne Applebaum. Anne is a columnist for the Washington Post. She's been writing fantastic pieces analyzing what's going on in Washington. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, a visiting professor at the London School of Economics, where she runs a program called ARENA, which deals with the problem of disinformation and propaganda in the 21st century. And she's a real expert on Russia. She won the Pulitzer Prize for her book, Gulag, A History. So she is perfectly placed to think about the unfolding Russia scandal and the fact that we have a president whose fondness for Russia, and for Putin in particular, remains at best unexplained. And my second guest today is Juliette Kayem, who is one of the nation's leading experts on homeland security. She was a former member of the National Commission on Terrorism. She served in the Obama administration as assistant secretary at the Department of Homeland Security, uh, where she handled things like the H1N1 pandemic and the BP oil spill. She's currently on faculty at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and she's a very frequent commentator on CNN as a security analyst. She was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist for her columns in the Boston Globe. So both of these women have a real depth of experience in the relevant areas. And um, I can't tell you how gratifying it is to be able to reach out to them and bring you their perspective. I'm not really set up to run a news division here, so being responsive to a news cycle that's changing at this pace is um, difficult to do. I actually had David Frum, who agreed to be part of this episode, but I can't interview him until Saturday, and I think things are changing so quickly. It's Thursday now that I'm going to push that interview off and leave him for another episode. That is, unless something remarkable happens on Friday, which is certainly possible with this president. But I recorded my conversation with Anne on Tuesday and Juliet on Wednesday, and even there, the news had advanced enough so that more facts were in play. This is why I usually speak to scientists and philosophers, so it doesn't matter when we record our conversations, and it really doesn't matter when you listen to them. Here we have a conversation which will probably not age terribly well, If you're listening to this a few weeks from now or a few months from now, the shape of the scandal may have changed a bit. The general principle, however, may still be worth talking about. And uh, there are general principles here, clearly, of corruption and ineptitude and financial conflicts of interest, all of which I'm confident will become more pressing in the coming months. I also have a few things to catch you up on with respect to my podcast tour that's coming up, but I I will do that in the housekeeping for my next episode. I will soon be experimenting with releasing two episodes a week, essentially doubling my pace, and I have some great people already on the calendar to um, help me do that. But for today, I bring you an episode that is narrowly focused on the events of this week. The date is May 18th. Up first is Anne Applebaum. Enjoy. 
And thanks for coming back on the podcast. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, well, listen, this is a, a an impromptu interview. You were last on, I think, a couple of months ago. It feels like years ago. But, you know, you are one of these topic experts. I guess you have two topics here, which are increasingly relevant. You are a journalist who can cover the ins and outs of Washington, but you are someone with with a real expertise in Russia and you think a lot about things like misinformation and propaganda and perverse ways that publics can be persuaded. This is great to um, talk to you again. So last time we spoke, several things had not yet happened. There was not the firing of Comey. There had not been the Russian photo op, and there had not been this recent apparent leak of classified information by the president, nor the chaotic attempts to prevaricate about this by his surrogates. Let's just walk through this a little bit. What the hell is going on, Anne? (laughs) Well, if I knew that, then I would be able to solve a lot of other problems. Um, I mean, I think the the outline of the problem and really the fundamental, the, the source of this problem really is Trump's relationship, or maybe it's better to say the relationship in his head, his feelings about Russia. Most of what he, most of what we know about Trump's relationship with Russia is already public knowledge. I mean, we may or may not learn something more from an investigation if that goes on. But most of, most of what he, he feels about Russia, he's told us. I mean, he's been saying it for many years. Um, he feels a closeness to the the style of Russian oligarchy and Russian kleptocracy. He feels, um, I don't know whether it's ideological or aesthetic, he feels, you know, that the system appeals to him. Um, He likes the idea of having a relationship with Russia. Um, And he can't really hide that. Um, So his, I mean, there were a number of points that may have been slightly overlooked in the last few days. One is that you know, the fact that he invited the Russian foreign minister to the Oval Office um, was already, in protocol terms, quite a big concession. I mean, he wouldn't have been invited under Obama, um, and certainly not after the invasion of Ukraine, would we have given, you know, it's a big deal for a foreign minister to get to meet the president. That's mm. always a gesture, because, of course, the foreign minister should meet the secretary of state and not the president. So he made, he went out of a way to make this gesture. Um, and his he and his staff seemed to be very lax about who the Russians are and what they represent. So as you as you hinted in your introduction, they invited not just Lavrov, but they allowed a, a Russian photographer into the Oval Office, um, who promptly after the conversation put his photographs online, which seemed to have surprised the White House, who didn't realize that um, he was taking pictures for publication. Um, and of course, we don't know what else was in his camera. Maybe it was a recording device, maybe, maybe um, you know, maybe, maybe other kinds of equipment. And that So it's very unprecedented, both for the foreign minister to be there and for him to be with a photographer. Um, And then we learn from the context of the of the this story about what he said to the Russians and also from um, General McMaster's statements today, we learned that he felt very comfortable with the Russians. I mean, he told them some, you know, what he he may or may not have understood what he was telling them, but he told he gave them some classified information. Um, He was bragging about his access to intelligence. Um, you know, he w- he treated them the way he treats, you know, people he likes to do business with or he used to like to do business with back in New York. You know, and this kind of behavior, which is, of course, unprecedented in the United States um, in, in recent presidential history, um, has all kinds of consequences. We are, you know, we American, you know, American intelligence works by a series of relationships with allies. And of course, we have our sources and, and methods and so on. But so do, to, so do others. We work closely with People in the Middle East, we work closely with other nations in Europe, and they exchange information with us on a mutually agreed basis. But um, the idea that we now have a president who's a security risk, who might blurt out anything in a room where he's with people he feels comfortable with, no matter who they are um, and what they might do with that information, is should be a clue or will be understood by American allies as you know, danger sign. Be careful what you give to the United States. Be careful what you give to this president. Um, his sympathies are not with, you know, his understanding of how intelligence works is is minimal. Um, his ability to, his, his judgment is terrible. Uh, he doesn't know to whom he should say what. He doesn't know who should and shouldn't be led into the White House. He doesn't seem to have any 
um, sense of it or any feeling for it. And um, he may betray you by accident. Um, you know, I often think that the best, you know, conspiracy theories are real ones are actually pretty rare. You know, yeah. conspiracy is hard to organize. It requires a lot of people and, you know, you to, everyone has to be quiet and has to be, you know, much, much more common in life is the kind of screw up theory of what happened. Um, and more and more, it looks like um, Trump is governed by a kind of, you know, incompetence, childishness, inability to keep his mouth shut, need to brag, need to show off. And his admiration for rich, powerful people um, are, you know, like like Vladimir Putin, who seem appealing to him and who who seem like they should be his friends. And that's um, that's now the governing ideology of this White House and not anything theoretical, not anything ideological, uh, not anything else. I don't know if you remember the the book or the film being there, but you know, I've been thinking of Trump as a kind of malignant Chauncey Gardner, just this completely yes, vacuous absolutely. character. And you know, and can I just say something funny about being there? You know, it's based on a book by Jerzy Kaczynski, who's a Polish writer. Right. Oh, and sure. And actually you the know idea it. of it is an older Polish story. There's one that uh, there's a version of that story that was written several decades earlier. And there is something there is a kind of East European story, you know, in these accidental, messy democracies, people accidentally take power. Um, and it's very funny. And, I mean, funny and sad, I guess, that this happened in the United States. But you're right. It's a very good comparison. So this Russian photo op slash leak happened the day after he fired Comey. You know, mm -hmm. The timing is just insane. You would think you could never recover from how bad this looks. And yet this is just one more thing in this cascade of ineptitude and seeming corruption or conflicts of interest. He's firing the guy who's investigating his administration for its possible collusion with the Russians and then meeting with the Russians, one of whom was the very Russian who torpedoed the career of Mike Flynn. Walk us through this a little bit more. And it's also true that the thing he is supposed to have leaked, again, not based on any apparent strategy to divulge secrets, but just because he's bragging about what good intel he gets. This is the sort of thing that wasn't even disclosed to our own senators. Talk a little bit about the context here, and perhaps this would be a good moment to get your view on the significance of the Comey firing. Well, the Comey firing. You know, once again, the most amazing thing about the Trump phenomenon is most of what we know about him is stuff he tells us. You know, mm -hmm. he's telling us what he's doing. I mean, it, he has admitted, in, in essence, in the, in the course of his tweets, that he fired Comey because he didn't like this investigation. He, he didn't like seeing Comey on TV talking about him. He didn't like the fact that Comey wanted more resources, apparently, for the investigation. Um, you know, and he thought, OK, in, in his sort of cartoon-like vision of the world. He thought, okay, if I get rid of this guy, the story will go away. You know, I can make this, I can get this man off my TV. I can fire him. Um, and again, that appears to have been impulsive. It appears to have been not, it wasn't consulted with anybody else in the White House. The White House communication staff were totally unprepared for it. Um, and so, well, you know, I don't, I don't have any very strong feelings about Comey myself. And I think he has made, he'd make some mistakes during the election. Um, the manner in which he did this was almost, um, you know, it was sort of so, so screamingly obvious that it, it makes one, be, you know, this is why people immediately afterwards began to talk about mental illness or some kind of pathology. Um, you know, he fired him to get rid of the story. He didn't like the story. He was getting too close to comfort. It had taken over some of his staff and he wanted it off. And then, as, as you say, then the amazing thing was that he didn't, it didn't occur to him um, to cancel the Lavrov meeting um, the following day. Uh, you know, he, he didn't seem to see the connection between these two things. I mean, and this is another oddity of Trump that he, you know, it's almost like, you know, as you mentioned uh, being there. I mean, one also thinks of, um, you know, people with amnesia or people who are unable to make connections between events. Did he not understand that people would link the firing of Comey to the Russian story? Did he not understand that having Lavrov in the White House the next day would seem creepy? You know, did he does he not make the connections between these things? And, you know, one is beginning to think he doesn't. He he doesn't 
see the world. He doesn't li link events. He lives each event as if he was in that particular moment. And he doesn't see what its relationship is to other things. Mm. Why people around him don't see that is mysterious, you know, but, 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 but he obviously doesn't. I mean, it may be that they have concluded that the best way to deal with this Russian story is to brazen it out, you know, just pretend it's not happening, mm. you know, go on making policy the way they want to, um, you know, being loud in their conversations and in their associations with Russia. Maybe they think that's how they're going to put it to an end. Of course, um, it may also have the opposite effect. Um, you know, an interesting point for you, something that one might think about is what the Russians think is going on, um, which is apparently they find it all hilariously funny, mm -hmm. um, which is also disturbing. Um, yeah, you know, that's not in much a way, of a comfort. The most, the, the worst moment for me of that day of Lavrov at the White House was, I don't know if you saw, there was a moment when he, he, he'd had a meeting with Tillerson in the morning at the State Department with the Secretary of State. And he came out of the meeting with Tillerson and appeared in front of, there were some journalists and one of the journalists shouted at him something, they shouted at both of them, something about Comey being fired and Lavrov, who speaks excellent English and is a profoundly cynical person, turned around and said, was he fired? What do you mean? I don't know anything about human fighter. And then he sort of, huh, he stuck his head back and made a right. sneering gesture. Um, and that was um, that was the Russian political elite saying, we think your press is ridiculous. You know, we think your rules and your laws and your democracy are ridiculous. You know, we're going to, you know, your president thinks you're fake news and we're going to go along with that. Um, so we have, we in, in a sense, you know, this whole process has encouraged you know, has just encouraged the Russians, you know, we're the, if the Americans are going to be more brazen, then the Russians will be more brazen, too. And that's that's another one of the side effects um, of this series of stories. There's a lot there. One of the things I find so depressing about Trump's presidency thus far is, and this is, again, like everything about him, this was predictable. And, and this is a point you've made again, and you've just made it, I think, today in a recent piece in the Washington Post. I mean, we, there are no surprises here. And yet, our capacity for astonishment seems undiminished. But one of the most malignant things about him and his influence on the world is that everyone in his orbit seems to catch this virus of dishonesty and delusion. I mean, it's like he's, he, all of his surrogates are like Baghdad Bob, mm. Saddam Hussein's spokesman during the the war in Iraq, where he's he's denying that anything is happening, and you can see American tanks, you know, passing by in the background. Obviously, people like Sean Spicer. It's just this tragic comedy to see an otherwise seemingly sane person try to put a brave face on the lies and delusions of a a man child in the Oval Office. But it's spreading to serious people like Tillerson, and they keep having to cover for him. And then he comes out and says, they're actually lying. I, I, I did it for the reasons that have been alleged, which seems to have just happened in this case. Well, this is what he's done several times now. Um, he did it with the Comey firing. He said, I, you know, the, the line from the White House was he fired Comey because of something to do with Hillary Clinton and her case. And then he said on Twitter, no, actually, I fired him because, you know, I didn't like him. And, you know, he was spending too much time on this story. Um, and he did the same thing today where he was there was an article yesterday saying that he leaked a piece of classified information in his conversation with Lavrov. And the White House came out and said, no, no, that's absolutely not true. And then the, this morning he said, well, yes, actually, I did. It's my right to do it. Um, so you're right. He's he he continues to he stabs them all in the back, um, betrays them and and they keep going. I mean, you know, this this isn't totally I mean, it's this is pretty new behavior in American politics. It's not unknown. You know, this is the kind of atmosphere you get in a in the, the court of a dictator. I mean, you know, Lavrov himself plays this role for Putin. You know, I've seen him do it. You know, when after the invasion of Ukraine, you know, Lavrov would get up on a panel and he'd say, no, we haven't invaded Ukraine, you know, or he would, you know, he'll de he'll deny looking you straight in the eye or looking the camera straight in the eye. He'll deny something that we know and he knows is absolutely true. And this is the kind of behavior you get in kind of dictatorial courts where, um, you know, people feel they constantly have to show their loyalty in order to stay in their jobs. Um, you know, maybe, you know, certainly there are some ver there are some honorable people in the White House, and it may be that some of them um, still feel they should be there to prevent Trump from doing anything worse or because, you know, they they feel some sense of patriotism and I need to help the country. Um, but you're right that at a, at a certain point, people become really profoundly compromised 
Um, and then you have to ask why they're doing it. Um, yeah. You know, after the end of the day, you know, this is the United States. It's not Uzbekistan. And nobody's going to shoot you if you resign. I mean, you can just resign. And one of the questions now is why more people haven't resigned. I mean, yeah, what are they getting out of doing this? It's that's not that's increasingly hard to see. Yeah, I think that's a very strong line to push. David Frum keeps making this point. You know, where are the resignations? Where are the people with principles and a conscience who just won't submit to having their reputations entangled with this moral and political catastrophe? But this is a point that I keep making. It would seem much worse. It would seem as bad as it in fact is if it were not as bad. If he did one tenth the idiotic things that he does, he would seem worse. But we just can't even keep up with the cascade of scandal. The news cycle just can't absorb it. It just keeps changing. He'll do, he'll do something crazy tomorrow, and we'll forget we were, what we were even talking about today. It's, no, it's very funny, you know, because I live in Europe. You're calling me. I'm, I'm speaking to you from London. And sometimes these things happen in the evening, so I'm asleep, you know, yeah. and then I wake up in the morning, you know, pick up my phone or my laptop and look at, I said, oh God, you know, and then I, you're right, I have to spend 30 minutes catching up on this, you know, another brand new scandal that I, that I wasn't ready for. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is another, um, this is a danger. I mean, the danger is that you, you know, we become overwhelmed by the stories. Um, there's a constant kind of fire hose of disinformation and fake stories and twisted versions of, of what just happened coming out of the White House, um, and to some extent coming out of a part of the press. I mean, I think um, Fox, you know, you talk about people inside the White House. I think some of the reporting on Fox News bears some responsibility for some of this, too. And, you, you know, there's a fire hose of stuff. It's very hard to sort through it and deal with it and think it through. You know, and people will, the real danger is that people just give up and they'll say, well, God, you know, this all, this all stinks. This is terrible. I don't want anything to do with it. I hate politics. You know, get me away from here. Um, I'd rather go sailing or, yeah. I, I don't know, I'd rather go for a walk. And the, this is a real danger. And this, by the way, is another thing that happens in authoritarian societies. You know, people become apolitical. They say, right, I can't take this. This is all craziness. I can't listen to it. Um, I'm going to retreat into my private world. Um, and I think we may begin to see that, possibly begin to see that in the United States too. Actually, that is a, an impulse I felt myself. It's just there's something so seemingly ineffectual about keeping score day after day here. It's just it's more of the same thing. And again, as you point out, it was all foreseeable. I, I know your time is short, Anne, and I want to ask you a couple of kind of quick questions. First, is there a danger here? I think we spoke about this last time, but it seems more pressing. Is there a danger in this narrow focus on collusion with the Russians in the end, exonerating Trump for things that he really should be held accountable for? Because it's quite possible, it seems likely, that the worst about what is true of him and the administration may not, in fact, be illegal. And, and by narrowly focusing on collusion or appointing a special prosecutor when we could be doing something more broad, like, a, like an independent commission, we could actually just miss the actual target. Is that something you're, you're thinking about? Look, so I, you know, I've said it, or I've said it just now. I mean, I think that the, the worst aspects of the Trump-Russia relationship are the ones that we know about. I mean, it may be that an investigation is going to find more, and it looks pretty clear just from what, you know, what we already know, that there were at least informal contacts between some of his campaign staff and some people and, you know, various probably Russian PR companies, but also some Russian diplomats and others. But the worst, the worst aspect of it is his admiration for them. The fact that he, this is the society he likes the most. This mm. is the country he doesn't criticize. This is the political leader who, who he feels, you know, most, who he finds most appealing, who he's just did this big favor for. He accepted his foreign meeting with his foreign minister. He tells, you know, he tells them, you know, intimate stories while they're inside the Oval Office. That's the, that's the story. And that's, you know, that's not going to be um, plumb. We don't need a special prosecutor to plumb that. We can see it. Um, and, you know, what he finds appealing is this authoritarian style, um, kleptocracy. You know, he wants to be like Putin, somebody who does business and does politics and makes money out of both. He admires that political system. He likes the brutality. He, he's, you know, he 
seems to even like the idea of maybe, you know, getting rid of some journalists. Well, that's something he'd like to do, too. That's, of course, you know, famously, Putin kills journalists. Um, not all of them, but he but he but select ones have have been have been murdered in mysterious ways in Russia. Hmm. And this is open. This is the American president, you know, who instead of, um, you know, and this and this is, by the way, somebody who knows very little about our own constitution, you know, and our own political system and indeed our own history, as he's as we also know from from many things he's said over the last few months. Um, but his his goal, his you know, his his greatest um, admiration is for this kind of political system. And I think that's the biggest scandal. And, you know, that's the thing we should focus on. What kind of a person is this? You know, this is not we, there's no American tradition of admiring autocracy or trying to bring elements of it to the United mm-hmm. States. You know, this is this is new. But, Anne, is there anything we can do with that focus? I mean, this so that is, for lack of a better word, a political liability for him as, as distinct from a criminal one. What can be done with that at this point? Can you impeach someone on the basis of their fondness for despots? Well, look, impeachment is, you know, impeachment is political. I mean, at the end of the day, Trump will be impeached if enough Republicans feel that he's a political liability. I mean, frankly, um, you know, I think you know, the, he's done things already that if 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 the if the Congress was willing to do it, he could be impeached. I mean, I think the fact that he didn't give up um, he didn't give up control over his businesses, full control mm-hmm. is impeachable because, you know, as you're as president, you're the Constitution says you're not supposed to get um, emoluments, which can be interpreted in, in the modern sense. He shouldn't be getting any revenues from his foreign businesses, um, but he is. So if you want to do impeach him, you could do it now. So it's really um, impeachment is going to be, if it happens, which it still may not, um, would be a political decision. So I think um, focusing on the the deeper, um, you know, the the deeper political problems, you know, and the and the the implications of what kind of a person he is and what kind of how he's running, how he's running the White House, and attempting to propagate those and discuss those and you know, help people to understand them who don't seem to get it, um, which is would would be his supporters and both in Congress and in, in the country. Um, I don't think that's a lost cause. Mm. I mean, at the end, if, if Congress wants to do it, they can do it. There's enough there already. Um, the question is, what will motivate them? And I think they'll only be motivated by by politics. Well, on that point, I have a question that may seem a little out of left field, but you, I mean, you know about the the rumors that there's apprentice outtakes of Trump using the N word with an impressive lack of self consciousness, and that these these tapes were not leaked by Mark Burnett and others there based on you know some political calculus. I happen to know you know to a moral certainty that those tapes exist. Can't really say how I know that, but I'm willing to say this publicly. I'm. I know they exist. So this you can imagine something analogous to the the Mark Furman tapes during the OJ trial. Would that be enough to move the dial or would that be just the same thing as the Billy Bush tape that didn't do anything? Look, it's hard for me to it's hard for me to say because um you know, I think so much of what he said is disqualifying. You know, the danger is that if you release those tapes that you would have you know, this con- counter reaction of people saying, oh, don't be so PC, you know, or there's a part of his support that doesn't that isn't going to care about that. I mean, the people, you know, 60 percent of the country will be outraged um, if they're not already. And then there's a part who will once again reject it because it, it doesn't bother them. So I'm not sure that that would be the tipping point. I mean, so it might have been during take? the election, but hard for me to see now. I mean, the what other is danger take? is, by the way, that there are other kinds of tapes in other places. You know, I know that this was a rumor that was unproven, you know, about Russian tapes. But, you know, Trump has been around for a long time doing um, discreditable things in many places, um, you know, including a lot of countries ranging from, I don't know, Azerbaijan to Dubai to um, to Turkey, places where he has investments. And in a lot of those places, he will have been taped. And there may we don't know what's floating around out there. So there may be there may be more eventually. So what do you think it's going to take? Because it, this is the thing that I find above all so depressing about what his existence is doing to American society. I mean, it's, it's just uncanny to continually hear from Trump's defenders who seem completely oblivious to his flaws, no matter how awful you imagine Hillary Clinton to be and how much you wouldn't want her president. It seems to me that 
you have to admit that Trump is showing some signs of of a dangerous unprofessionalism, at least. And so, I mean, what do you make of the fact that there seems to be no path from where we are through the brains of Trump's defenders to an admission of what should be obvious, that this person is unfit for office? What would he have to do, do you think, to actually turn the tide? I mean, you know, it may be a combination of promises not kept. Um, you know, you may begin to get people disappointed with him. There's a little bit of that on the right. I mean, on the on the sort of far right that supports him. Um, if you begin to get a different tone on the most important media sources, you know, the the the, the, the television that people watch, which is mostly Fox, um, and the, the 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 websites and you know, and, and, and Twitter feeds and others that that Trump supporters support. If you begin to get a different tone, you might be get you might get some change. But you know, we're we're confronting something that others. You know, this is a this is a kind of cult. You know, it's not a normal political movement. People aren't moved to be part of it by argument. Mm. Um, it's something to do with identity. You know, these are people who you know they want to call themselves real Americans. That's why they use that expression. They they want to they've they've created almost an online tribe, you know some countries have real tribes and America now has online tribes and the sort of online, you know Trump tribe identify with one another stick together you know interpret the world in similar ways and and find some kind of you know there's some form of I don't know whether it's security you know or a feeling of being part of a gang or a crowd something that, that people are getting out of being inside that group. And feeling themselves to be beleaguered, you know, by I don't know, by the mainstream media or by the elites, um, and they, you know, they find some kind of new identity being part of this group, and so it's not really logical. And so all the logical, um, rational arguments that you could make, or the ones that used to that normally we think move people in politics, aren't working um, because it's not a normal political movement; it's tribal. Um, and, you know, it, incidentally happening in other countries at the same time, too. I mean, I think it's one of the many unexpected side effects of the Internet and particularly of social media is that people can now organize themselves differently online. Um, and one, one of the things that happened is that people who feel the same way about, about Trump are all in a single group now and they reinforce one another. Um, you know, it may be that the to change them will have to be you know, it won't be rational arguments. It will be emotional things that happen. Or um, it may be, as I said, it may be a change of tone of some of the leaders. It may be that you have to deal, find out who the most influential Trump supporters are. But no, I, I don't have an instant answer for you. I think it's going to be very difficult because it isn't normal politics. It's interesting that any criticism of Trump is perceived by these people as mere partisanship, whereas it's just, it's so clearly not. What many of us would pay to have Mitt Romney in the Oval Office? Well, even, even odder than that, like, you know, I mean, it's not a choice anymore between Trump and Hillary. Hillary's not going to be president now. It's a choice between Trump and Mike Pence. Exactly. You know, whether or not you like Mike Pence, he's not a, you know, he's he he's not, um, you know, he's not childish. He's not a braggart. He's not, you know, unstable, uh, which the president is. So why aren't, you know. I mean, this is what I don't understand about the Republicans. Is isn't this the moment to say, right, we prefer Mike Pence? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, Hillary's not an issue anymore. So that that's the that's the stranger question to me. Just to spell that out so that it can't possibly be ignored. Everyone who is hoping for impeachment is hoping for President Pence. Now, given my job description, President Pence is a nightmare scenario, and yet he's so much to be preferred to Trump. Well, he's a balanced person. I mean, he's he he thinks logically. He connects events together. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have this bizarre thing that Trump has of not remembering from one day to the next what he said. Um, and he do, he doesn't seem to lie. I mean, at least not like Trump lies. You know, he's not he's he doesn't build his whole existence on completely false views of the world. So that's, um, you know, so it's in that sense, he's reassuring. But I mean, there are other problems with him. But that's the choice now, Trump and Pence. It's yeah. not Trump and Hillary. No, I mean, he's got the, the background problem of, of real ideology. I mean, I, I view him as a kind of theocrat. Mm -hmm. you know, his level of Christian fundamentalism is disconcerting. But it does come down to, as you say, it's temperament, it's personality. I mean, there, there's something wrong with Trump as a person. And this has been obvious for decades. 
And it's the reason why he got elected in some sense. I mean, we, you know, people love this about him. They love the grandiosity and the the sense of his own competence in areas where he is so clearly incompetent. He can't even appreciate his incompetence. I mean, it may, it may be that people like the entertainment. Look, you know, we we you know, national news has suddenly become a reality show. You know, we crash from one bizarre story to the next, you know, mm. each day trying to figure it out. I mean, it's a it's practically, as you say, it's a full time occupation just to keep up with it. You know, that's how people feel about soap operas yeah. or reality television. You know, it's a it's now a um, it's a pastime. And that might appeal to people. Well, let's hope we don't entertain ourselves to death. <laughs> I agree with you. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you for uh, the recap. I hope to never speak to you again on this subject. Let's have a better <laughs> subject next time. Let's let's do something different next time. But somehow I think that's not in the cards. Keep it up, man. You're, Thanks a you're lot. indispensable. Juliet, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. I I think uh, although given the subject matter, it's uh it's difficult times. But you are a woman who has met her moment because it is just it's so much fun to see you on CNN. I mean, it seems like every time I turn on CNN, you're there and you're cutting through some partisan mm. miasma that is thrown up in defense of the indefensible. And there was this, there was this adorable moment I caught a few days ago, I think, which I, I don't know who you were talking to, but some someone who was essentially in defense of Trump playing the usual obscurantist game began to kind of interrupt you. And you said, no, 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 no. Don't interrupt me today. This is actually important. You know, you're, you're at the big boys table now. Yeah. And, and it's <laughs> like, like, you know, we know, we all know how this game is played, but right now the American people need to hear some facts and I'm going to give right. them the facts. Yeah. So it's it great. Is, well, I, I appreciate this. It's, it's, uh, um, you know, when, when Trump won, um, for a lot of us who you know, I care about public policy. I'm in safety and security, which, you know, obviously there are Democrats and Republicans, but we, we, you know, we, we tend to be agree on more rather than less. Um, you know, a lot of us struggled with what's our role in this day and age. And, and, you know, some people, you know, hit the streets, which is great. And, and some people file lawsuits and, and I took a little while to figure out sort of what lane would be helpful to people. And, I appreciate you uh, saying that because, um, you know, maybe it's working, which is just, you know, there's I just sort of call out the BS quota, uh, but also make it clear that a lot of this stuff really is significant. This is not uh, this is not a test. Uh, uh, this is the real thing. And uh, and the actions by the president in what is is we're talking on a Wednesday it really is only a 10 day period, starting with the Sally Yates hearing. Um, it's just remarkable for its uh, its disruption to our norms, its its dissolution of uh, respect for institutions, and where it heads. Um, I can't answer that. No one can answer that right now. But uh, we we can certainly talk about it. Well, I, I want to walk through all this. And again, we're talking about events that have moved really quickly. But I think we should start on this issue of partisanship because there's something truly perverse about the allegation of partisanship that gets hurled against anyone who spots any sort of problem here with the president's behavior. My criticism of Trump from the beginning has been just about as vituperative as possible. I mean, I, I, would, I would mortgage my house if I could figure out some way to spend the money to get the guy impeached, right? I think that he is a true danger. But there's absolutely nothing partisan in my attack on him. Anyone who wants yeah. him impeached is hoping for President Mike Pence, as crazy as that sounds. And you know, given my concerns about Christian theocracy, Mike Pence is, is nowhere near the top of the list of someone I want to see run this country. But there are fundamental differences between what I worry about with someone like him and the, the liabilities that yeah. Trump is displaying. So there's nothing partisan about uh, I, the analysis I, we're about to get. I, I agree. And what I tell, you know, what I tell people, I mean, there's a couple ways to think about everything going on in defenses and not defenses of partisanship. I mean, there are good people working in government now who need Republicans to speak up. I mean, in other words, if I hear another senator, you know, or House member say, you know, McMaster and 
and the Secretary of Defense and Mattis and, and you know, great people, you know, strong people, people who've devoted their lives to this country. They're, they're in the room. Well, and you know what? They need us, right? They need, uh, because my guess is they're not idiots uh, and they actually know the dangers. I, and I use that word. I've not used that word before this week. Uh, the dangers uh, that, unless fixed, uh, will continue with this president having access to the information he has and um, and access to the apparatus that can do much damage to this nation, uh, damage that that you know we we can't even imagine right now. Um, and and so you know, good good Republicans are doing good Republicans no favors right now. And again, this is we're talking about issues of competence and temperament. Yeah. We're not talking about partisanship or even policy. I mean, who knows what policies Trump will endorse six months from now? But the problem is that we've elected someone who is acting so erratically that his fitness for office is yeah. is certainly in question. And again, this was totally foreseeable by those of us who were worried about this close to a year ago. But it's just getting more and more salient and. The other thing that's corrosive is, is that the toxicity here spreads. Everyone around him suddenly becomes morally compromised. And you have serious people like McMaster and, and Tillerson who have to either lie outright or resort to Orwellian euphemisms mm -hmm. to just shield this boy king from embarrassment. It's deranging of a, such a, a wider circle of, of, of seemingly serious people. That, I mean, that, that's alarming in its own right. Right. And that in and, and the depths to which they are willing to do this may mean that they've sold their soul to the devil. I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, uh, which is um, they are often not in the room. Right. When when Trump is tweeting about tapes or or uh, uh, defending whatever he told the Russians, you know, they're not in the room at that time. And so they they sort of have to pick it up. But, I, you know, there was there was a whole bunch of social media insistence that McMaster, the present national security advisor for, for doing the kind of press conference, you just decide the press statements, which sort of was trying to, 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 you know, fit in through a narrow lane that didn't throw his boss under the bus, but also, uh, made sure that he did not lie. You know, people were saying, well, McMaster, if he was a good man would quit. And I, all I could think was if McMaster leaves, I'm no huge fan of a lot of his policies. Like who do you think is next? Right. I mean, the, the, and so I want, because I don't know how this ends, Good people need to stay, but good people and and their party, like Paul Ryan, need to man up. And I mean that honestly, like the fact that Paul Ryan could have said this morning, we're talking on Wednesday, so it's after uh, the the news of the Comey memo. Paul Ryan can say, "I try not to get involved with things I can't control." Paul Ryan is number three in the constitutional order. I mean, that is closer than anyone else, right in the in the country. So, you know, if you could get more Republicans to own this, um, you know, whether the the Trump can be fixed or whether the fix is President Pence, uh, we will see. But it, this cannot sustain itself. I, I, got, I was on a plane when the news broke about the Comey memo. And, you know, I, I, I try to keep calm. I, I try to be on air and just give perspective. I'm you know, I, I let others do the resistance and the impeachment and all that stuff. I, my role is better just sort of trying to put a lot of noise together for viewers and listeners. And one of the but I just I tweeted out sort of instinctively, this is too much, like it just on a personal level is, and, and just think that multiplied by 350 million Americans plus it's it's too much. And it's it's, you know, there's a clause in the Constitution that's called the take care clause. Now, it normally means that the president shall take care, you know, for the laws to protect and defend the laws of the United States. But I, 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 I want to, you know, view it m larger now that the take care clause is really about, you know, sort of nurturing this country. And this is a president who's doing the exact opposite. Yeah. And encouraging a political culture of conspiracy theory yeah. and just a nihilistic embrace of delusion, delusion that they have to know is delusion. I mean, you, again, we're talking, right. you go down the rabbit hole with people like Alex Jones, and these people have influence, and it, it's just a mind bogglingly irresponsible thing that's happening from the top now. Yeah. And it's not irresponsible. I mean, it's irresponsible in a partisan sense. You know, what Fox News is focused on some 
conspiracy theory this week. I mean, the thing that got me out of, you know, I don't, you know, the, the thing that got me to the word dangerous, right. That I had not been there. I thought there were lots of ways to describe this president was the news. The first bombshell was of course the news on Monday about what he may or may not have disclosed to the Russians. Everyone's focused on the Russians in the room and sharing information. And did they leave a bug there? All of those possibilities. Um, but I was more focused on what happens after. I, as you know, I've spent a career in government and counterterrorism, um, and uh, and so a disclosure like that, which clearly was more than his staff anticipated, a disclosure about what was a a, 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 a more imminent threat than not by ISIS. Uh, we all suspect that it has to do with what's animating a potential extension of the laptop ban on airplanes. Um, this is ISIS's uh, sort of growing capacity uh, to be able to get something um, in a computer to detonate near the skin of an airplane, um, uh, which would bring the airplane down if midair or something that uh, they've wanted to do for a while. So this is this is adult stuff. So the Washington Post story, which broke the story, uh, has a, uh, a few paragraphs, just a few paragraphs in a rather long story that says, well, afterwards, various members of, of the national security staff immediately called the Central Intelligence Agency and the NSA. Um, so you know, everyone's focused on the Oval Office. I'm focused on that because I know uh, what happens and it's actually now being confirmed, which is uh, the president, um, and I don't, I don't care what his motivation was, uh, potentially compromised a, a real life person. We now know it's an Israeli asset who was able to infiltrate ISIS. I say we know in, in quotes, I mean, uh, good reporting has disclosed that it was likely an Israeli asset who has infiltrated ISIS. You've got to figure that took a couple years. And the reason why more experienced members of the national security staff from Trump's, uh, from the White House w would call over is because the CIA and the NSA would certainly have to notify the Israelis that their asset had been compromised. And that has to happen quickly. Why? Because the Russians may not be, may not have immediately gone back and called, but an asset who's infiltrated ISIS, a Western asset, which is so rare, as you know, Sam, uh, or a Western aligned asset. Uh, would not be easily communicated with, right? I mean, in other words, you you that person will go missing for periods on end, and if you need to try to reach them, it might take hours, if not days. Anyone who watches Homeland certainly knows this. So we don't know, although there is now some reporting uh, that Israel does view that asset as compromised. We do not know if the Israelis were able to act, extract him uh, in time or what the Israelis decided to do or if the message got to that person in time. I say this with total clear eyes here. This is not conspiracy theory. This is someone who's worked in the depths of national security and counterterrorism. My voice is somewhat shaking because the this this is why I call the president dangerous. It's because this lack of respect for processes and this lack of interest in how hard it is to be to defend America um, led to the scenario that I just laid out to you. Um, I pray that that asset got out or or was not exposed, uh, but I, I I wouldn't count on it. I mean, we just we simply don't know at this stage. Mm. Yeah, there's just this colossal unprofessionalism. Yeah, and this is what his fans like about him. I mean, they like him as a wrecking ball. He's shaking things up. He's draining the swamp. This is not politics as usual. He's destabilizing everyone who thought they they knew how Washington works, but unprofessionalism mm -hmm. certainly runs the risk of getting people killed, as you say, but you know, starting wars. I mean, this is just like- Yeah, and, and we or have, a mistake. Yeah. And we have allies that can't depend on us now right. because we have an erratic person in charge. It's And amazing. worse, you know, from, from, the, from the left view, you know, so, you know, because uh, I'm not one for conspiracy theories, but boy, you know, my, I don't like it, right? But I believe that it is true that they're an apparatus, the intelligence apparatus, the deep state even, call it what you will, will begin to modify its own behavior to ensure that its commander in chief is not fully in the know. I don't like that. I don't care if the president's a Republican or Democrat. I don't like um, the deep state making calculations like that. Uh, but on the other hand, I can't reject it right now. In other words, if in the briefings, you know, there are decisions made about the extent to which the president will be informed of, of, of sources and methods or of what third party, what country may be supplying us information. 
you know, the president sort of handed him, handed them an invitation to do so. That's not good from a, from democratic purposes. Um, and it's certainly uh, not good uh, because, you know, we can't be guaranteed that that will right size itself uh, after Trump is president. Uh, and so that's, that I believe will be the Trump's damage isn't only today, it's going to be however this all ends. As I say, I don't know how this ends, but however this all ends will be, will those uh, systems that have been stretched, avoided, challenged, undermined, criticized, you know, uh, 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 violated uh, uh, by the Trump White House, will they be able to get back to the checks and balances that we deserve? And I, I, I hope so, but I don't know if anyone can, can, uh, can guarantee it that. Uh, that. I want to talk about how this could conceivably end, but first I think we should talk yeah. about recent events and the context of what's just happened. So many things happened in quick succession. We had the firing of James Comey, the director of the FBI, who was leading the investigation into the possible collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. We had that bizarre Russian photo op the next day after Comey was fired in the White House. And now we have the revelation that Trump leaked classified information to the Russians at this meeting, and that, as you say, staffers had to run out and call the NSA and the CIA to warn them about this in an effort seemingly to save someone's life. And this was not in some calculated way that he was declassifying information for a strategic purpose. He was, it seems, just boasting about what good intel he gets. And this was just take a moment to flag just what a stunning irony this is, because his entire campaign exactly. hinged on Clinton's unfitness for office because of how she used her private server and her alleged confusion about whether certain things were classified or not in her email. And now we have him directly sharing classified information with the Russians at a point past which we know the Russian government has been working full time to disrupt our democracy just 24 hours after he fired the person whose job it was to investigate what the Russians have been doing. Yeah. It's, uh, if you're Hillary Clinton, whether you liked her or hated her, uh, you cannot envy her. I mean, you know, I mean, so you have to be sympathetic to her right now. This is, I, I, I always say, however hard it is for the rest of us, whether you liked her or not, or didn't like her, um, th this is like uh, this is like an irony on steroids, right? Lock her up becomes what animates the president's mantra about her, uh, you know, her responsibility as a potential commander in chief, and um, and you know we're we're you know free falling um, into potential conflicts left and right, danger, you know, all around us uh, because of a president who, according to Reuters, I should remind your listeners, the Reuters had a report out you know, whose attention span is so short that even in intelligence briefings, you know, they, they have to keep him down to single pages. They, he likes visual aids. And one person is at least quoted, um, it's, you know, something like uh, that, that they put his name in as many paragraphs as they can because he tends to search this stuff uh, uh, for his name. I mean, oh so, God. you know, this is, this I is, uh, you know, this is what we have and who we have. As commander in chief, I, Sam, if I can, I, I want to begin a day before in your litany of what's happened. Um, I know, we, I know, there's more that happens after what you said, but I actually think that the Yates and Clapper hearing, which happened on Monday, started a lot of this um, because, as we've certainly, both you and I have certainly read, mo, you know, while firing Comey may have been in the atmospherics for some time in Trump's mind. Uh, they really came to a head on Tuesday, you know, less than 24 hours after Sally Yates, the sort of rock star who told of a uh, White House not seeming to care about uh, uh, the fact that its national security advisor at the time, Mike Flynn, uh, could have been compromised. But um, but also the testimony of James Clapper, the former uh, head of national intelligence. Uh, Clapper, I know he's a controversial figure as well. Many people remember him as as uh, uh, not disclosing uh, uh, the. Uh, some of the major uh, surveillance uh, programs under the Obama administration. So he's, he's not loved by everyone, but Clapper had what I called the quiet storm of testimony. It was Clapper who told in open hearing two things. I mean, one was uh, that uh, his previous statements that he had seen no evidence of collusion should no longer uh, be utilized by the Trump White House. Uh, the Trump White House had often used Clapper uh, and Clapper had once said, I never saw evidence of collusion. 
because he now realizes he was out of the loop then that there was an ongoing FBI investigation. So he sort of just, you know, shoved that talking point back to the White House. But he also said something interesting uh, that the investigation uh, was bigger than the question of collusion. And I'm very careful when I'm on air. I don't, you know, I talk about the Trump Russia investigation as a spectrum between, you know, benign and collusion. We we are far from benign, but we're not yet a collusion. And maybe this this all has to do with financial wheeling and dealing. And Clapper uh, seemed to uh, suggest that as well in the testimony. Uh, and then 24 hours later, we learn uh, the FBI has expanded, expanded his investigation of financial dealings. And that's when Trump fires him. Um, I have to believe those are not unrelated because the firing of Comey came as such a surprise to everyone, including his inner staff, his press team, as well as to Comey himself. Yeah. So this is, a, I think, perhaps the most important point. And this is a point that David Frum has also made, mm-hmm. that this narrow focus on collusion may be setting everything up to essentially exonerate Trump of conflicts of interest and political problems that should be totally damning of his administration. So I, I guess the question for you is, what are the chances that the things that we should most worry about with Trump are not actually illegal. Let's say, you know, financial dealings with with Russia and other ways in which he's compromised by Russia, which in fact are not illegal, but are just catastrophic in a president. Well, there's a couple answers to that question. So one is, I, I think that's pretty likely. I mean, I think, not that I do I think that Trump's team had every capacity to collude with the Russians? Yes. Do I think the Russians needed to collude with the Trump campaign? No. Um, in other words, everything that they did, you know, they knew what the calendar was. They knew who John Podesta was, you know. Um, and so, and then, you know, Trump has all these characters around him, like Roger Stone and, and others who uh, are very dangerous, but it'd be very hard to prove in a court of law or in impeachment proceedings that Roger Stone was in a room with Donald Trump and told him, I'm telling the Russians to do this. And Trump says, yes, tell the Russians to do this. That's going to be very high standard. But it could it could prove true. We don't know. But before that is all sorts of just um, inappropriate um, uh, uh, financial dealings that would then give clarity to the American public of why President Trump is so beholden to the Russians and to Putin. I believe and this is now me stepping outside of my fact role just but I believe, you know, that is very likely that, you know, you have a very cash poor family company. Um, and they needed bailouts. And one of the reasons why we never saw his tax returns is that those bailouts and that property purchasing and everything else was coming from the Russians. So he's beholden to them in a very different way. That's probably not impeachable. It could be illegal if he lied about it or or whatever else. Uh, but it's certainly relevant um, to how we would judge him as a president. Um, and I think his independence from uh, Russia Um, And, you know, could start, you know, outside of those is, of course, the I word, the impeachment proceedings, which do not have to follow uh, criminal law. Right. You can impeach someone for something like being beholden to a foreign entity and not having independence because your company is propped up uh, by them. And so I'm, I'm with David. I read his stuff and I think I think he's terrific. And I think this focus often by the left, um, that's not fair, this focus by some people. Um, on there's proof of collusion and collusion collusion is just a, it has a potential to antagonize many who we don't want to antagonize during this period. It also has the potential to uh, set the stakes so high that, you know, on the spectrum that I described between benign and collusion, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on. And it, that is bad in and of itself, even though it might not reach to, to collusion. Sam, if I can say also, I think that there's just something interesting going on right now um, on the Comey firing that, you know, your viewers, I I said it on air earlier and your viewers just, uh, listeners just might be interested in. There's a a growing um, uh, sort of placement of Jared Kushner at various important moments during uh, the last 10 or 11 days. Uh, Remember the Wall Street Journal uh, uh, right before, uh, the day before uh, Comey was fired, uh, had a story about the investigation getting into financial dealings and the Treasury was very, very involved with the Trump-Russia investigation. 
A day before that was the scandalous behavior by his sister and essentially selling the Trump Kushner name to get to get money so that Chinese could get visas. Um, And then now reporting today that Kushner was very much involved with the firing of Comey. So if I were looking at this as I do as an analysis, I can't prove anything. But I think you're this is not the last to hear about uh, Kushner as well, who was supposed to be the calming influence in the room. Yeah. Yeah. And assuming more responsibility for the running of the United States than than anyone in history. So you said a few things that are very important there. One, I I just want to clarify the process of impeachment. So impeachment is a political process is is not a criminal one, right? So w- right. what is impeachable and 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 how low a bar is that? If the Republicans just decided we don't like this guy, is it would it be trivially easy for them to find a reason to impeach him at this point? Uh, well, they would have to satisfy, you know, they would have to 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 write up articles of impeachment. The the numbers, the standards are are high in terms of numbers that they can't do it with just one extra vote. It's not willy nilly. You need numbers, right? And on the Senate side, you need significant numbers. But the articles of impeachment can include things that are not crimes, right? They you know, the high crimes and misdemeanors is always the language, but it can include, you know, conduct not befitting a president. It could include let's ins- let's assume that we had a president whose psychological stability was certainly in question, which I am so surprised how many people say that on air now, people that I thought would never get into psychological mumbo jumbo, but people like David Gergen last night on CNN, who I thought would avoid that that issue. And that president did not recede uh, voluntarily. Uh, So there are so you, you, you know, there has to be articles has to go through through numbers. And, you know, one of those articles you could imagine would be you know, failure to take care of, uh, uh, you know, of our foreign policy because of, you know, uh, you know, essentially being financially propped up by the Russians that, and you wouldn't have to prove intent. You would not have to, uh, be in a court of law. And so, yeah, so, you know, the constitution has a, you know, political check, uh, but it requires, Congress to get a backbone. And, um, and you know, you're seeing it in dribs and drabs. Uh, I think that to the extent that the polling remains below 40 percent and one wonders if the next poll, if it might be closer to 30 percent, that might wake people up. Uh, but it is an option out there. It's not, I wouldn't hold my breath, uh, given at least, for example, what Speaker Ryan said this morning, um, and he would be the person to to launch this. Uh, but uh, I do, you know, these things are cumulative, right? So you, you had the, you know, you had the, the, the Yates hearing leading to the Comey firing, leading to the, you know, story about the in, intelligence breach to the Russians leading to the Comey memo. I mean, you had all of that in a nine day period that has a cumulative toll. Um, and one hopes that, that, uh, politicians who, uh, have not stood up might begin to. Yeah, there's really a special opprobrium deserved by Paul Ryan here because oh, God. the degree to which he has been craven from the start, it just it's just been shocking. I mean, I just remember yeah. a 60 Minutes interview you know, way back in the day when Trump was first revealing just how chaotic he was capable of being, and you just could not get Ryan to take if there's a principle rattling around in his brain somewhere. It's just, you, you cannot find it. Tax cuts. Yeah. That's his, ta- that's right. his principle. I mean, it's, it's, I've never seen anything like it. And, and, you know, you, you and I, you know, you know, sort of cogent adults during the Romney Ryan run, uh, just God, just four or five years ago, you know, he was the boy wonder. I mean, he got so much good press. And then all of a sudden I realized maybe he's just not that smart. Maybe, you know, maybe he's a man who actually cannot deal with the moment that history has thrust upon him. Because I keep thinking, you know, if, if we all survive this, I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean that literally, but, you know, however this ends, right, history will judge this period and there will be heroes and villains. And you and I, you know, not like, you know, we're not like, you know, f- throwing firebombs at the FBI, right? You know, I mean, we're, you know, as a rational adults on certain you know, sides of the aisle and stuff. We know how that history is being written. And I would just think for self-preservation, if you're Paul Ryan, wouldn't you want to be on the good side or the right side of that of that history? I I I compare him 
to um, Judge Ito in the in the OJ trial. You know, sometimes history thrusts upon a man um, uh, a responsibility that he is not uh, terribly qualified to own. And I just think that's Paul Ryan right now. I mean, he might be, you know, not even getting into his motivations. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, you've, you've got to believe he is hearing from his uh, rank and file who are looking at their numbers um, and hopefully he will move. But I agree with you. I've never seen anyone just not own it. I mean, he is third in line to the presidency. And as I said earlier, I mean, he had the nerve to say this morning he tries not to get too involved with stuff he has no control over. I was like, okay, you know, you know, you and I have no control over it in some ways. He has control over it. It's funny you bring up the OJ trial because I have a question uh, related to that. But one more question about just recent events here that may be, may give some foothold or motivation for impeachment. Is there a credible claim with respect to obstruction of justice with Trump firing Comey or asking Comey to drop the, the investigation into Flynn or any of these other things that have yeah, recently been I, I, I actually think that is very critical, cr- credible. And I'm surprised at the skepticism of legal analysts and others who I've, I've been watching or reading. Um, but that may just be, you know, because the standards of intent are so difficult. But I, I mean, look, President Trump said to Lester Holt, I wanted this Russia thing over. He, uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee, um, Sanders says, you know, we want a conclusion to this. I, I mean, in other words, they're, they're, they're leaving more they're, than breadcrumbs. They're, they're leaving loaves of bread saying, this is exactly why I did it. So there's that, there's the Comey memo that came out yesterday, which all of us predicted anyone who knew Comey knew he would have done that. Uh, the fact that Trump was not aware of Comey's MO, so to speak, that that is, uh, he is well known for, as, as many lawyers are for, you know, m- memos to the, to the file. And I wonder out loud and other people have wondered out loud, if you're Comey and you're setting up, uh, these stories, right. Leading to ultimately you testifying before the Senate, which I, th- I guess he's going to do next week or the week after in an open forum, you wouldn't lead, uh, with, uh, with your plot twist, right? I mean, in other words, if he's, he, I presume that he or his people are the ones leaking the fact that this memo existed and in the Washington or the Washington Post or New York Times, whichever one, in the New York Times story yesterday that discussed the memo, it did say that uh, there are other memos related to his interactions with Trump. Um, and so I've, I've got to anticipate that, uh, that shoes will con- you know, continue to, to drop on this issue alone on the, on the memos issue alone. But I have no doubt in my heart and mind, uh, giving the benefit of the doubt as I often do to, uh, 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 to a president, right. That this was direct obstruction of justice. I don't know how you read it any other way. Um, they lied about their defense of why they, f- they fired him. They, um, and I think the only way, only thing that would make me think otherwise, honestly, was if they put, if they kept McCabe, uh, this is the number two, the deputy director, uh, if they kept him as the FBI director, uh, that would make me think, okay, maybe this was more about Comey than getting rid of this investigation. But if they put one of their political hacks in, you know, how could anyone interpret it any other way? One more question before I get to, um, OJ. Yeah. <laughs> His financial entanglement with Russia, I mean, given that that is, seems to be the center of the bullseye, why is it that so many people, virtually all of Trump's defenders, are so sanguine about his not having released his tax returns when he promised to release them and when the release of them could clarify more or less all of this, right? If there's nothing to worry about, why not release them? And why not urge him to release them? Like, why, why isn't Paul Ryan urging the president or the rest of the congressional Republicans urging the president to release his tax returns? I mean, I can answer this just as directly as I think the, the right answer is, which is they know, one, he is not as rich as he claimed, and two, he's in massive debt to various loaners. I, there's no, I mean, why else wouldn't you show your tax returns? Um, and why don't they do it? I mean, one is the squishiness of the leadership of the Republican parties you and I have been describing. Um, but part of it is if those tax releases ever get leaked or disclosed, 
Paul Ryan is going to own it, right? I mean, Paul Ryan is responsible for President Trump. He did not stand up to him. He did not fight him. The party kissed the ring when they saw what the base was doing. And un and unlike what you saw in France, where the equivalent of Republicans, when they lost to, uh, uh, when Le Pen came in second, they they you know they said we are not going to endorse her you know, country before party. None of those guys did that. And so they own Trump. And so I suspect that where Trump goes, they goes. And that Paul Ryan sees a lot of this as self-preservation uh, as much as anything else. Now, for you and me, when I, if I were thinking of self-preservation, I'd want to get ahead of this tsunami faster than anything and say, look, I took a leadership role and, you know, we'll see what happens next. I, I don't understand what's going through their mind. If they think that if they, like literally every shoe that drops every day at 4.30, do they think that's the last shoe? I mean, I have literally not been home uh, and have been on air. We just, I had to count uh, for, for a variety of reasons and have been on air for 27 days straight. Um, and I have a very loving husband and sometimes at seven, sometimes it's at 11. So it's okay, I could be home. And it's because I, an, you know, I anticipate that some shoe is going to drop at every day at 4.30 and my evening will be blown up. And I, it's, just, it's just this lack of foresight, but part of it is because they own Trump. They own him. They did nothing to stop this. And, and um, the New York Times columnist, Ross um, Duther, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, D-O-U-T-H, people know him, a conservative, you know, uh, reminds us, you know, how, you know, how can we be surprised? We knew that this uh, neg at best negligence, uh, at worst unlawful behavior existed from, uh, from the beginning. And, um, and that's, the, you know, just, you know, before we get to OJ, but, you know, one of the things I worry about the cumulative impact of, you know, Yates and Clapper and the Russians and Comey and the Comey memo is, um, these are all self-inflicted. I mean, Sam, you and I first met talking about terrorism and the threat to the homeland and at a forum that we first met at, and I've spent my, I've spent a career in this in Homeland Defense. This, this, oh, like all of this stuff is, is internal. I mean, we're not talking about the threats this nation faces or immigration enforcement or uh, radicalization um, or uh, access to guns or, you know, buttressing soft targets. I and mean, we, Yesterday, the Department of Homeland Security issued an extended terror advisory alert, and it was like a tree, you know, falling in the woods where no one's around. I mean, um, there's real stuff out there, and uh, and and the president seems uninterested um, and certainly uh, incapable of supporting, you know, the intelligence agents who are helping all of us protect the country and. If there is an attack, you know, we, we, people disagree about, uh, you know, what motivates terrorists and you know, your specialty in terms of religion and Islam and radical Islam, we can have reasonable disagreements. But I know uh, if there is a terror attack, say it's just, you know, Orlando-like, for example, this president will divide this country in ways that um, are terrifying, um, even to those who uh, have been warning, you know, about the rise of radical Islam in this country. Uh, and I, I, I brace for that. Uh, you know, we talk about day one or we talked about day 100. And I am very worried about the day after, right, if there's an attack. Um, and yet, you know, this, this White House is spiraling out of control and there hasn't even been a crisis from the outside. Yeah, yeah. Well, I worry about all of that as well, and and it's yeah. it's incredible to think about what's not getting done by the U.S. government because it is so yeah. consumed by scandal. Forget about protecting the homeland. I mean, just infrastructure and some of the things that Trump wants to get done probably shouldn't get done, right? Right. So it's probably a good thing he doesn't have time well, to accomplish yeah. his goals. But it's just this is the most inefficient, yeah. wasteful use of human intelligence and energy at the highest level it's 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 really astounding yeah it doesn't see it doesn't cease to amaze and yet you know you sort of you know as between him being a successful president uh, given some of his policies and an unsuccessful one uh i think good americans you know should not be criticized for 
hoping that he remains unsuccessful uh, because some of this stuff is going to harm lots of people. Okay, so the OJ trial. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the last question. So, so we all remember the Furman tapes that uh, were fairly decisive, among other decisive things in that trial, where he was heard using the N-word with abandon. And we know there are rumors about similar tapes from Trump that are outtakes from The Apprentice, where he did, I think, 10 seasons or something. Now, I happen to know on good authority that those tapes exist. I, I haven't heard them. I'm not in possession of them. I can't release them, though I would be happy to release them if someone wants to give them to me. But I'm wondering what effect you think that would have. Would that be enough to make Trump just truly radioactive and force Paul Ryan and in front of a bank of microphones to disavow him? Or would that be more like the Billy Bush thing where people could just say, don't be so politically right. correct and, and this is a non-issue? I think uh, given uh, at least the polling I've seen, and none of us tr trust polling, uh, the extent to which women who voted for Trump are turning away from him, I think a lot of it has to do with health care if those tapes are similar to the Billy Bush tapes or worse, as some of us have heard, uh, I don't think it's survivable, you know, in the sense that, you know, the, the, the specter of Hillary Clinton as the potential president so animated so many of his voters, she will not be around again. And at some stage, I do think adults will begin to think, What's so wrong with President Pence? And the fact that you, it cracks me up that you are like, what's so wrong with President Pence? I know in the alternative, but it is true. I, I don't get it. What is so wrong with President Pence as compared to President Trump? Obviously, there's a lot of good options elsewhere. Uh, so I, I do think, I think, I think what I anticipate in terms of leaks, if you thought about the road ahead, would be obviously leaks related to his personal interactions with other women or his wife and also uh, uh, more Comey uh, uh, potential obstruction of justice. I honestly believe, Sam, that uh, whatever strategy Comey has, and we all knew, everyone but Trump knew that when he fired him, Comey planned for this. I do believe that, um, that whatever he led with this week um, is not the end of it. And that should, you know, that might give a lot of Trump's critics joy and pleasure, but, you know, we have, we have a government and, you know, at war with itself and that it's, you know, even for me, I, I find it uh, disconcerting. But I will say one thing. I am much more confident in the institutions of governance. Um, they may be taking slower than you and I like. They may be a little bit too weak and with no backbone than, than you and I may like. But I feel better now as someone who cares about government and has, has been in government, cares about institutions, believes in bureaucracy, you know, all these things. You know, I don't have a disruptive character. You know, I'm not a billionaire for a reason. You know, I actually believe in, in process and rules and, um, and history and, and things that guide us and make us smarter. I'm much more confident in America's resiliency than I was, say, during the transition. During the transition, I was, you know, as I said, we were all trying to figure out our roles, uh, you know, whether it's the media or the resistance or people on the streets or the lawyers or the courts or the or the the bureaucracy clearly defending itself against Trump. There's a lot of noise out there. And uh, and, you know, even if, you know, if if we lose. Uh, we didn't go down without a fight. And I think that I think that should give people a lot of inspiration. Well, listen, Juliet, it's so great to have you as a voice to call on for conversations like this. As someone who has spent the last 27 days on television, you're incredibly generous with your time. So thank you. Oh, my pleasure. I know this is, and, and thank you. I mean, as you know, because you clearly watch CNN, and I'm supposed to be on Anderson tonight, but God knows with all the cancellations and the uh, and everything. I noticed that CNN has hired a lot more legal analysts in the last two days, which suggests they may be preparing for a big trial. But uh, as someone who uh, you as a as a viewer uh, uh, certainly knows, um, I get about 23 seconds to speak each time. So I am very grateful for this 45 minutes uh, and, and letting me try to put some of the pieces together. Well, unfortunately, 
this won't be the last time we talk about this, Juliet. <laughs> Anytime. Yeah. Okay, we'll take care. Talk to you soon, Sam. If you find these conversations valuable, there are many 